welcome to another broadcast of The Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past shows are available in podcast form. Find them at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions, emails, and comments to dj at artistfirst.com. And now here they are, Michael and Margaret Lines. <laughs> and thank you very much, G. Gosh, this is starting off well. <laughs> Hi, Scott. <laughs> Good to be with you guys. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Oh, it's terrible. Uh, I'm Michael Lyons. And I'm Margaret. And I'm not going to say another word for the rest of the hour. <laughs> oh, boy. I think I must be, it must be, it must be what, what our topic is tonight. It's just got me all flustered. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and in, case of, in case the rest of you are out there wondering what could get me flustered. Lots of things, actually. We could have a whole show about that. But uh, um, uh, what, I, I don't know if this flusters me. But it's an interesting topic, and we came up with this um, really just very, very uh, sort of out of the blue, but I think it's appropriate. Uh, Tonight we're going to talk about emotional thinking and other oxymorons, jumbo shrimp, Mm. military intelligence. Mm. Um, Because I believe, well, I'll say that uh, emotional thinking is ubiquitous. Uh, and and the thing about emotional thinking and why it is an oxymoron is that oftentimes, even though the words are emotional thinking, it's really thinking after an emotion or really even even perhaps more precisely using your intellect to support or to uh, buttress the reason behind your emotion or to put a reason to, to add a reason behind your emotion. A, a good example of this is you kind of um, instantly make uh, a, a reaction to something. You know, it's the, I don't like that. And then you feel, at least uh, it, uh, oftentimes, you feel the need to justify your um, instant, whatever emotion it was, whether it was like or dislike. or And so you, you, you build below or after sort of it's ex post facto or after the fact thinking to kind of be able to say well if you say i don't like something all of a sudden you know you feel that in the back of your head that you have to just to to tell yourself a story about why yes i don't like something and this is the reason right and and then sometimes that that goes one step further and turns into action in, sense, in the sense that you take whatever thoughts that were predicated to support your emotion and then say, well, I should take, you know, I should do something to get back at them, whoever they are, or I should, I should take an action because of the, um, because of the reasons that I made up <laughs> for my emotion, if you know what I mean. The, 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 in this case, the facts come after the event, <laughs> or, or the, or the, uh, uh, and, 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 and it's a very um, common form of thinking in human beings. We, we, all, we can all find examples of our, in ourselves and in others of this kind of thinking. It's a very dangerous form of thinking because you reach a conclusion and then look for facts or arguments or thoughts or reasons to support it. Well, um... When you have a, an emotional response to something, uh, and and you decided, as you said, say you, you dislike something, what you're doing energetically by quote unquote reasoning is actually feeding the emotion. Mm. It has nothing to do with pure reasoning. What your internal is doing is like I want to maintain this emotion because of the energy hit I'm getting and whether you and that's the interesting thing it's it's whether it's beneficial to you or not you're going to embrace 
and try to hang on to whatever that emotion that rose up into you. If it's anger, you want to stay angry. Hmm. If you've decided you don't like something, you want to hang on to the dislike and keep feeding it until it turns to hate. Hmm. Anger is held on until it turns to rage if you continue to feed it. And without that awareness, you are riding along this emotional roller coaster, believing that somehow, you know, well, gee, I'm not in control. But the fact is, you are. If you continue to feed it, it grows. I want to go back. That, that was a, that was beautifully said, and I think the part, the very interesting part there, is that you're um, in feeding the emotion and wanting to stay in the emotion. Um, emotion has enslaved thought in one sense. Uh, the emotion that you feel uh, is let's 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 walk, let's walk back a little bit. All emotions are um, un hidden and usually triggered by something that is what that is the purpose of emotions emotions have a have a i won't go into the details but they have a tremendous survival mechanism which is where they come from they prepare the body to do something now that works great if you look throughout the animal kingdom there are emotions and we and we can easily see the emotions that that tie into survival acts when you're threatened or when you're um, when when you have to react quickly, emotion it comes with it for us and for for all um, beings, uh, you know, all uh, uh, entities on the planet. Where we um, get into trouble is when we apply our reason as a means of feeding the emotion without a trigger. So we are triggered by something. It happens to us every day, many times a day. You, you feel enraged, or you feel happy, or you feel something, something that hits you. Interestingly enough, what you said is, is, is anger and fear and rage are more hungry emotions. I'll put it that way, because you said we feed them. Um, happiness, uh, or you know, the, the emotion which is ascribed to happiness, because there are the seven basic emotions. We won't go into that. There's a whole other few shows on that we could do. But uh, there are emotions which are hungrier. They require more uh, investment. Anger is an emotion which requires more investment. It, 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 it takes a lot more out of the body. Because you, you know, in the survival situation, anger is incredibly important. You want to be prepared to fight or flight. You know, this fear, anger, which are very closely aligned with each other, those two emotions, fight or flight, come from a threat. So a threat, something threatens you. In the in in prehistory, that thing would be something that wanted to eat you, <laughs> but now it isn't. Now it's it's something which um, has hijacked the emotions of anger and fear, but it's still just as needy. It's just as hungry, and now we feed it by making up stories to keep it going. You, you the, what you said was exactly right. You in essence use your thought as fuel. And, and rather than, um, you know, the, the, the converse of that is to say, well, you know, I, I, I feel angry, but let me, find, let me find out what's really true here. And that's interesting because what actually is unfolding is the fact that you are searching for thoughts that will re-trigger you and re-trigger you and re-trigger you. Yes. Which is fascinating. That's, that is how it begins to build. You are actually embracing thought that will re-trigger you into that emotion, whether it be anger, and that made me more angry and more angry. Now suddenly, oh gee, I'm I'm not in control. There's rage. Right. 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 The 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 um the, the concept of a of a feedback loop is something that people don't understand, but it's really very simple. Um, when when you if you hit a drum and the drum makes a sound. And if you hit it at the right moment again, it makes a louder sound because you're, you're feeding energy into the drum and it starts to resonate. A feedback loop is a way of, of, a, of driving the drum to be louder. 
when your thoughts feed the emotion and re-trigger it and, and in essence become um, imaginary or at least um, non, non-physical triggers for maybe something which actually was something really did frighten you. You know, something really did attack you. Something really did make you angry. Let's assume that there was an, an original, primal, correct trigger. Because our emotions are hard to fool. We actually, um, they're actually very discerning. You know, when, it, when something hits you with real anger, usually it's, there's a purpose for it. But then, because we put our thoughts into it, we say, well, why am I angry? Oh, it must be. <clears throat> and then the, it must be. We, we latch on to things which, which, which we may have made stories up in the past. We have a story about this and a story about that. And they become, um, with mental fingers, gathered from those piles of, of let's say, uh, pre-made stories to stuff into the fire of the emotion. Because emotion is fire. Emotion is, is juices flowing in your body. Emotion is energy flowing in your, in your psyche. It- it's energy flowing, but um, each emotion uh, just energetically is, is akin to different forms of matter. And I'm not going to go into it because... Hmm. Go into it. Why not? Well, the emotion of anger was always um, akin to fire. Hmm. Okay. There are emotions that are akin to water. Mm. Uh, Wanting things is akin to earth. And things like envy is always used as things that that you see that you want. It's a mental uh, kind of response. So that is different energetics all the way through. Mm. Uh, they flow differently. Just as you said, anger can build very quickly. Mm. And that is like fire. It flares. Uh, I agree with you about the uh, the analogy, especially... Um, but I, what I mean is, uh, I, fire is, is one of the um, representations or one of the symbols of emotion, of various emotions. But emotions are always energy. And if you find emotions which are needy ones, ones that want more fuel, like anger, fire always wants to burn higher and hotter. Um, Others may not be as needy. Yet any emotion which is appropriately triggered. um, I did many years ago, I did a bunch of of work on this, but to to kind of summarize it, emotions are the are a subconscious or at least a sub thought um, response that that we all are familiar with suddenly feeling something we all get this we suddenly feel something the the thoughts which we gather underneath it are are actually part of the reaction phase of emotion but we 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 generally don't if you haven't, you haven't been trained, you don't discern that. You think you feel angry, and then you find something to be angry about. <laughs> you know? So these two things are, are very close together. They're, they're, but the, the, the sequence is you feel angry, and then you find something to be angry about. People think, you made me angry, but you've already gone two steps. You think you've gone one step, but you've gone two. You've gone into turning emotion into uh, or rather identifying the source of the emotion, or at least laying the, attaching the emotion to something. And then there's the third step. This third step of, uh, and there's two ways to go. The third step of either processing the emotion and coming back to, uh, let's say, a non-emotional state, at least a normal, let's call it a normal state, although, you know. And then there's the, the one you were talking about, which is happens to a lot of people. You find something to be angry about, and then you, because you're triggered and because you're angry, you find other things. You know, you, you find that the anger doesn't just have one thing. It, 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 um, it has strings. It has stickiness. It pulls in other things. Or it starts to build and it starts to need more things. And so it can become, 
the two emotions that are or three that are most commonly associated with the with the extremes anger is very con- very consciously associated with rage uh you can you can make yourself so angry for so long that you become enraged or you become um uh, sort of a perpetual in a perpetually angry state. Sadness is another one. Sadness can turn into deep depression, and you can be, you become sad, and then unfortunately, in this in the in the um, toxic form of that emotion, you become clinically depressed or constantly depressed. You're constantly sad, and you're finding other things to be sad about, and you build and you keep feeding the sadness, and it turns into in essence, a uh, a depressed state of mind. Um, fear is another one. Fear uh, can can put you in a perpetual state of anxiety, a perpetual state of almost paral- paralysis, because fear engenders more fear. If you let it, you. What am I afraid of? So. Yeah. No. Anxiety would be uh, an emotion that you would akin to the realm of air energy. Yeah. Okay. And depression is. Uh, Earth energy. No. But to understand that there is this distinction and what you put your attention to is the key. Are you putting or concentrating on the anger so that you maintain the anger? Are you concentrating on the anxiety so you continually find reasons to be worried? Are you continually um, finding reasons to be sad so that you walk into depression? Hmm. It's consciously choosing what it is you are going to look at. Place your attention on and embrace because what you're doing is embracing whatever emotion it may be that you've decided to concentrate on. And you need not do that. You really need not do that, but you must make a conscious decision not to engage. Yeah, well, I mean, and and in these in these situations of toxic emotion, therapy would be one of the therapies is to do exactly that. Um, you know, there was there have been a number of scholarly articles written by the Dalai Lama about emotion. Amazing, interestingly enough, he's sort of a scholar on this topic, and he equates it with what you just said with mindfulness you become mindful of two things you become mindful of the fact that you are in an emotional state at the moment i I think what you were talking about was far down the road when you've you've worked yourself into this horrible depression and you need to work your way back out of it but um and and i think that that's also very very beneficial that this mindful state but it's a constant thing is the point Yes. Uh, it's, it's not just when you're in the depths of it. Yes. Uh, but, yes. Uh, the, 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 the Dalai Lama has said that um, it's very, first of all, it's incredibly challenging to do this. You have to be very um, consciously practicing this uh, sort of, of uh, discipline. He calls it a discipline where you realize that you are in, we will all be, and you are in an emotional state, and then you realize that you are, and you will will do, this, this idea of finding thoughts and justifications and sometimes whole stories from your past generally, but sometimes in anxiety, anxiety in the future, that you pull in to justify. And he said, he literally says that those first two things are almost impossible to intercept. Very, very far down the road, if you get discipline, you can intercept them. You have to you have to become mindful in the third stage, the stage when you're building it, when you're when you're starting to build the house and build the feed the anger. Feed, he said at that stage you have to say, "I'm angry," and I have all these justifications. You have to stop yourself and say, "What am I doing? What am I doing?" You know, or or even he says he says identify it. I'm doing it again. I'm I'm feeding my own. I'm feeding the, the anger. I'm feeding the sadness, and stop yourself there, and then realize that at that point, you don't have to do anything. It's interesting what he says. He says you don't do anything. You just sit in the anger, right. or you sit in the in the sadness, and you just wait, 
And the, the peace that will come from that is that it will fade. Because um, we see this in children, and it's, some, it's a shame that more children aren't trading this, and, and good parents do this, and we all kind of do this to ourselves. You realize that you are going to be angry, and you're going to uh, ascribe the anger or the rage or whatever it is, or the sadness or the fear or whatever it is to, have, to somebody or something. And then we, we unfortunately, through, through many years, people have said to children, don't be angry, don't be sad, don't be this. And, and we sort of build up a wall. Oh, I'm, I shouldn't do that, so we stuff it in a hole. This, this is very bad for emotion. Emotion just festers in holes in the psyche, and it becomes toxic. You have to encourage children, and you can do this to yourself too. It's just, yeah, so you're angry. That's okay. Just be angry. It's okay. Just be angry, but stay there. Don't don't add to it. Don't don't feed it. Just say you're going to be angry for a while. It's okay. And then, amazingly, as is true with all of us, you'll find that you're less angry after a little while, and you're less angry after a little while, and all of a sudden you're not angry anymore. And at that point, you have to tell yourself, "Oh, I was angry. That's okay. I'll probably be angry again, or I'll be sad again, or whatever it is." But it's all, it's all good. Uh, I realized that I was angry and that I thought all these things and those, I shouldn't take any action. That's what Dalai Lama says. Don't take action. Just sit in your anger, sit in your fear. And that's the way out. The way out is to stop the action, which is part three of, of the little play that we play for ourselves. The, the action can be finding more things to be angry about or it can be actually screaming, yelling, carrying on, and making, making a terrible mistake that you may have to live with for the rest of your life if you, if you let anger rule you. It's observing. And the first part of being able to observe what's going on is to disengage. Hmm. So you have to disengage from feeding whatever the emotion is first and just observe in the observance you give space Mm. your attention gives space so that what you are truly feeling is filling that space and you are experiencing it yes many times the emotions are un they are not acknowledged right and what, that's what they are fighting to be, is acknowledged by you, your consciousness, your attention. Your attention creates the space by which this emotion can be allowed to be expressed. Because if you stuff it back in, it goes under the table as we term it. You do not see it anymore. It is you're shoving it into the unconscious and there's a part of you that's got a hole that mm. somewhere, that ball of emotion that you're trying to control and you think that controlling it means that you've got to shove it under something. Mm. And that's not who you are as a human being. No. The art of being human means that you are capable of being able to set your attention objectively at the emotion you are feeling and allowing it to express. Expressing the emotion doesn't mean that you engage in a physical act. Right. That is the misnomer. Because usually when you start shoving unresolved emotions somewhere, you actually shove it into your body. Mm. And when you shove it into your body, your body is going to react. That's where violence may, may rise. This is what people don't understand. If you give space to the emotion that you are feeling and do not shove it into your body or in your unconscious, then it will, too, express and pass without harm to anyone else especially yourself because when you shove unresolved emotion somewhere you do damage to yourself yep it, it, absolutely true and um, I would say also 
because people are taught to shove emotion away, to um, you know, to control things and, and don't show things. Um, there's two different things that happen here. There's sort of a, a, a social dichotomy, and there's a, a gender dichotomy, at least in our society. Women are often told not to show emotion of a certain type. They're not. They're told not to show anger. Uh, men are often allowed to show anger, but they're, not, they're told not to show sadness. Uh, and so you end up with, if you follow these kind of societal norms, oftentimes boys are said, boys don't cry. And girls, are, if girls act out and are angry, they're 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 um, uh, oftentimes disciplined harshly for for being out of control or, or angry. Well, those two things become extremely toxic. Men have a a terrible time in this society after many, many years of being told not to express emotion, that when emotion finally rises up, when sadness hits men, it oftentimes destroys them. You know? Yes. Similarly, uh, you know, if you're told over and over again as women that you can't show anger, when anger finally rises, it becomes this, this towering volcano of rage because shoving emotion into your body or shoving it into a box in your psyche, it's like a spring or a or a unexploded bomb you know the next time it triggers it's been roaring under the surface it's coming out stronger the next time and stronger the next time so if you don't allow it to rise up give it space because it's going to rise up anyway it's going to require you to acknowledge it but not to act on it let it be be in it you know it's again a being state it's a human being state and most of us have not embraced the fullness of our humanity and what it means to be truly human. What? And emotion is all part of that. Emotions are part as well as thoughts. And to be able to distinguish between the two is also important. Very important. Um, at one point before, I don't want to miss, go by this too quickly. The um, The the emotional body and people talk about the emotional body is part of your being we are incarnate here we are souls incarnated in flesh with coming from spirit we've talked about this in the past in flesh emotion is is a body reaction but it you are so closely tied that it immediately invades into the soul and the mind and the mind the ego has a lot of odd, but odd, odd uh, reactions to emotion. In its most basic, when you're a child, you feel bad when you feel sad, or you feel bad when you feel angry. Somebody, somebody, somebody makes you angry and you want to yell and scream. Somebody makes you sad and you want to cry and bawl your eyes out. Okay. You, you, you. At the moment you see children do that, the reaction of adults is 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 patterned deep. When you're in an emotional state, you learn things that you never forget, never forget, because emotion also ties to deep structures in the brain, and deep structures are learning. So, when you teach a child that emotion is something which is part of their being, and it's going to happen, and you're going to feel bad for a little while, and it's going to go away, and you're going to feel good again. This is this allows them to to pattern that, and to realize that this is part of my being. It's part of my incarnation. It's it's okay, and we know how we learn how to deal with it because as you grow older, emotions become you no know, more powerful, not less. You know, a child's anger is not the same as the anger of a, of a teenager. It's not the same as, it, as the anger of an adult because you know our our power, our psyche our body power, our mind power grows, so do the emotions or the way they affect us or the depth to which they affect us, experience. Uh, so learning early, and this is the Dalai Lama again, he's, we should teach, he, he was advocating this should be taught in every school, this yes. idea yes. of being and allowing and giving space to your emotion, which is natural and necessary and needs the space, needs, as you said, acknowledgement. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Let's yeah, well, that's a good idea. Let's and let's take this moment. We'll acknowledge that despite the fact that we're going to rave and foam with the mouth, we're going to go back to the studio for a little break, and we'll come back on the other side and we'll talk more about thinking versus emoting.
as a Reaper is the story of five-year-old Christopher Aaron and his life-changing struggle with leukemia. Winner of both the Indie Bragg Medallion as well as the reader's favorite silver medal for memoir, There is a Reaper has more than 100 Amazon book reviews and a five-star rating. It has been described as life-changing, spiritual, a must-read. Just released on Audible and iTunes, this memoir is also available in paperback and on Amazon Kindle for only 99 cents. Get your copy of this life-changing memoir today. Taking God on Patrol is a first-person account of the world of law enforcement from the perspective of a Christian police officer in the fourth largest city in America. From speeding car chases to the crossing of the thin blue line, author Mark S. Kariner seeks to find God's biblical truth in a behind-the-scenes look at law enforcement. And check out Mark's newest book, The Tactical Heart. Both are available at Amazon.com. The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed is the latest book from Michael Lines, the award-winning author of There is a Reaper. Featuring 13 original stories, this wide-ranging collection has everything. Forbidden love, gods versus demigods, weird invading aliens, sexy seductive artificial intelligence, and unusual passion between the living and the dead. All set amidst fantastic worlds of pain and loss and boundless joy. From the sublime to the macabre to the bittersweet, The Fat Man Gets Out of Bed will leave you breathless with laughter, brimming with tears, trembling with suspense. Available now on Amazon.com, Google Play, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. Rick Rodan fans, love mythology with plenty of action and humor? Destroyer's Blood is for you. The new fantasy novel by award-winning author Michael Lines is book one of the adventures of Dev Kalian, the Blood series. Follow Dev and his magic sword betrayer as they are suddenly attacked and forced to return to Olympus to fight in a war they want no part in. The world of men and gods is about to be destroyed by Zeus's ancient foe and only Dev and Trey can stop him. The conflict never stops, and the amazing twist will have you on the edge of your seat. Act now while the ebook is on sale for only 99 cents. Destroyer's Blood is available on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, Kobo, and fine e-tailers everywhere. And while you're there, get the free prequel, It's In The Blood, available for a limited time. The wait is over. First Blood, book two of the Blood series is out. Your favorite bad boy thief, Dev, is back, and the beautiful and deadly Trey is right there with him. She is sharp, sexy, and full of surprises. Their adventures continue as a new power arises to threaten the world. The heart of creation is under attack, and time is definitely not on their side, as they battle against their enemies' undead hordes. Can they unlock the hidden power that can defeat him, or will his forces draw first blood? Get all three installments in the series. Book Zero, It's in the Blood. Book One, Destroyer's Blood. And the new release, Book Two, First Blood, today. Available in ebook and paperback format on Amazon, Kobo, Apple, and most other fine e tailers. listening to the soul of the everyman on the artist first radio network let's get back to your hosts michael and margaret lines thank you very much dmit and, and tonight uh as we've been talking for the last half hour about it about um emotional thinking and i think that let's 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 back up a little bit i think that what we came up to came up with last half hour is perfect uh, but the the other half of this and i think people are sitting there and and if they've been following the show for any length of time, they, they say, well, but last week you guys said that you should allow your emotions to guide you and you should think with your gut. Well, you're right. We did say that. We're, we're vast. We contain multitudes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no there's, there, is, there is a non-toxic way to allow your um, misenteric brain, your emotions, your, your body, uh, your gut, if you will, to, to help you... Um, to help inform your thinking, 
Um, what we were talking about with emotional thinking is really thinking after the fact. And, and, and the consequences of thinking after the fact, and in essence justifying um, reactions, can be bad, or it certainly can be, um, it can be a sort of a, a, uh, a, something that will take away from your experience of being, and it can deny a portion of your humanity. When you're in touch with your emotions, when you've done this sort of work of allowing the emotions to become, to have space in you, there are other things. The body has many, many ways of, of speaking. Uh, and the heart especially is, is the part of you which is very good at, at codifying and synthesizing these, uh, these tells, these very, you know, your body has these amazing senses which sometimes aren't well understood, especially by the mind, but the heart understands them. And so what we're talking about there is not, is not emotional thinking. It's allowing the heart to feel from the senses which are far outside of the ego and of the mind. The mind likes to think it's everything. It's everything comes through me and I, I get to figure out everything. Well, no, the, the mysenteric brain, as well as many other senses in your uh, vastness, in your vastness of body and soul, um, speak through the heart and give you the clue. So, so when you first contact a person you do not know. All those senses are out there. The energy that swims through the universe, which we see in many ways and feel in many ways, but there's many ways we don't understand how we, how we sense that energy or, or we haven't fully, under, fully named and, and, and made into mind things, will come in through the heart and will give you a feeling. Or oftentimes you can, we, we call it opening ourselves up to grace or opening ourselves up to spirit. You're opening yourself up and saying, you know, give, uh, I, I, I have an issue, I have a problem, I have a decision to make. You know, inform my thinking with, with things which are beyond thinking. So this is, this is the idea of allowing, I think Malcolm Gladwell or um, there are many other folks who have written books about, you know, in essence, allowing the, um, the other senses to speak giving them space for decisions, for, for actions, allowing, allow, you know, listening to the soft voices that tell you, do that, or don't do that, or, I, you know, I like this, or uh, I can trust this person, or I can't, I don't like this, and I don't trust this person, rather than, than um, letting them drive you, you let them inform you. Right. Um like to just sort of go back a little bit to the way the Tibetan mindset looks at the world and and you as a human being. Mm. The Western world has four states uh, or elements. Mm. Okay, you have your fire, your water, your earth, and your air. But in the Buddhist tradition, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, there's a fifth element, and it's called ether. Hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen some of the monuments that they make, but uh, it is to represent all five elements. The base of the monument is usually a square, it's a block. Um, the step up from that, and it's, it's steps, and then up from that is a sphere, which represents the water. Uh, and then it um, goes up to uh, this, how do I describe it? It's almost like a spire, which is a representation of air. And then um, with a flame, which is, is also fire, but at the very top is this almost cup-like form with that flame. And that cup-like form represents ether, mm. which contains all of it. Translating that into Western mindset, that represents spirit. 
That is your spirit. And uh, earth is your body. Uh, air is your mind. Mm. Uh, water is your soul. Fire is this, how do I even describe this? It is an aspect of, of, mm, I get it, it, I'm trying to find another word to, as an analogy. Go, go with it. Are you talking about the, the stupas or whatever they're called? Stupa. The stupas. It's you, called a, see, you see them on the temples all the time. Mm-hmm, and, and they... They, they always they always ride they're always at the highest point or near the near the highest point and they're almost like a pilgrimage up to the stupa. Right, and, and there's a whole there's a bunch of traditions that they do with the stupa. There's hmm. usually a figure of the Buddha sitting in the middle. Right. And that's actually there's been um it's almost like what they would do to um in Egypt to preserve the body of the monk. Yeah, mummification almost. It's like a mummification, but what they would normally do is they there's a whole process and their bodies would be sitting in lotus position and then they would have goldsmiths cover the entire body with, with gold because they felt that that was the only element on this earth that would be able to maintain the high frequency mm. that this monk was able to... Uh, hold on this earth. Uh, and not every monk gets encapsulated in gold, by the way. It's, right. Okay. It's, it's the beings like the Dalai Lama that have lived lifetimes. Their souls come and they live a lifetime where they've um, brought their being state up and held this high frequency. And then that qualifies them to be able to be... Um, so these two Western and, and um, the two are analogous, at least. Uh, in 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 in, uh, it's just that they think differently. This is there is a distinction between your consciousness and the rest of you, mm. and you are. That's why um, the meditation of just being able to sit there is so important, because it trains you to be able to observe dispassionately what is going on. It doesn't mean you don't have a reaction, Hmm. but it means that you are allowing that aspect of you, consciousness, to grow. And the discipline is in what you place your consciousness on, what you decide to engage in. That is a whole process. The awareness of your consciousness, and then what you decide that you need to engage in. Two different things. Most people think that whatever thought seems to be flying past my head is what I should be thinking of. Well, or emotion. I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm recalling, I don't remember his name, but there was a, um, again, I, I believe a, a either Tibetan monk, and his his journey was in essence realizing that his his emotions were very strong especially when he was young he would feel very fearful he would feel very anxi- a lot of anxiety and through um this type of discipline he learned that the anxiety still comes you know the the emotions still come your your um your being isn't complete if you were an emotionless being you wouldn't be human uh you would you would be something lesser you know, and and certainly something that would um, would evoke a reaction of sort of uh, you know rejection from an actual human being. So, what is this emotionless automaton? So, emotion is part of who we are. It is it is essential. But the uh, e- emotions, when they are uh, when they occur, they can feel overwhelming because the emotion has an advantage of surprising the mind. Now, it doesn't surprise the, the, the whole soul. It doesn't surprise the spirit. 
because this is all of you. This is this is the this is the vastness of you. But it surprises the mind. The mind thinks again in its little eye mobile that it has control of everything. And emotion knocks it off its kilter. It takes it out of its planned action. It, 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 it's an essential thing because, again, for survival. But once the mind has been knocked off of its pedestal and emotion starts raging, the mind has a reaction in and of itself. It wants to... Reassert control. Reass- exactly. Reassert control. And, and this is, is wrong in and of itself. First of all, the first wrong thing is the mind thought it was in control. <laughs> the mind has a way of doing that. The mind thinks it's got all under control. It's got all, it's got all the lists. It's got everything. Everything's da da da. Emotions like no, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know? and it's like the mind goes blah. <laughs> what happened here? You know, I thought I was in control. Um, neither one is in control. They both need space. They both have to be acknowledged. And there's an overconscious. There is, there is a consciousness which is beyond the mind and is, is beyond emotion, which encompasses both, which is what the Dalai Lama is talking about, is, is the, the consciousness of you can observe the mind, it can observe the body, it can observe the emotion, or all three, and other things beyond you into spirit, the vastness of time, all these things. This singular consciousness is where all these things can reside and be. It's a being state. The mind is a doing, going state. The emotion is is just a roaring thing that comes and goes and like sea tides through through things. You you need to give them their space. Uh, But you must do that from a a point which is um, in and of itself immovable, the, the center point. The point that you come to where you observe all things isn't swayed by emotion it isn't controlled by the mind it isn't it is just there it is observing the consciousness well the especially in the western world we want to say okay it's the mind is the most important thing exactly okay but that is skewed because your being state is that center point and each part of you has a right to be expressed as a conscious being you choose when and how it is to be expressed whether it is your physical body and it has certain needs or your emotions that rise Mm -hmm. and it needs to be expressed in a safe space um, because I think that's the other thing that happens is that the emotions that rise, people have a tendency to give it, they want to give it the second place to what the thought is. And that, mm. that is the mistake. Yes. Because the emotions that rise up are actually energy waves that are part of the being state. And they do need a space for expression because that part informs consciousness that this is the response that is happening. Mm. And this is how important this issue may be. Pay attention to this. Mm. This needs a space. That's where your emotions are are most in a wondrous tool mm. where you can be insightful for yourself. I am feeling this. Where is this coming from? Observing what triggered it, what was not resolved. And in that moment, you've decided not to push it under the table again because you're uncomfortable. Right. Then when you have your thoughts come in, the thought wants to say, wants to reason, oh, no, that's not, well, gee, that's not right. Well, that's not, it's like, no, no. You will also have a say in the observations, but you are not the part of me that judges or makes 
the final call on how we as a human being, all of me, I as a human being, will operate. Give me the input, give me the data, the observation, the analyses, but you also have a place. So your body, and then your body's sitting there going, oh, what am I going to have to bear now? <laughs> well, the mind does put the body through things. But that's, that's a very profound insight because it, it, this goes back to Tolle a little bit, to Eckhart Tolle. You know, the, 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 the part of you which is, the part of you which lives in the now, is the stage upon which all things, all other things depend. Uh, you know, the consciousness, the emotion, the thoughts, all the things, and everything down. And, and thought is, is interesting, because thought is way, it's very derivative. It's three or four times away, if you will, deriving, deriving, deriving away from the consciousness, from the being state. It's, it's very mental. It's very contrived. It's very dependent on its own self for informing itself. It's got a little bit of its own kind of spin. And we all know that about thought. Emotion is closer to the being. I think you just said it. It's a close thing to the being because it, even though it comes from the body, it, comes from, it, it, it doesn't put spin on things. It, emotion, again, is like a tide. It colors everything. It washes in. It, it really uh, it puts the mind at sea. Because the mind is floating on top of emotion and doesn't really know it. It's a tiny boat on a, light, on a large sea. But consciousness is below it all, encompassing it all. It's the earth, if you will. And the earth or the consciousness has to be for all the other things to, to float and, and sail and run around on it. The, the Buddhist way is it, consciousness is the ground of being. Yes. And and so Tolle would say that that <clears throat> when these when the when your your you know thought mobile is going along and it's put off of its tracks and swamped by emotion, you you per force can't let the thought mobile try to try to somehow damn the emotion and, and ball it all up and stuff it away. Nor can you let the emotion completely swamp the thought mobile and turn you into a raging monster with no control. You need to be in the consciousness and say, yes, you, you're important. Your thoughts are, are important to me. The emotion, you're important to me. All of, all of me is important to me. But as you said, the part which, which is living in the now takes all of those inputs and then says, in essence, the next moment. What, what will happen in the next moment? And the, that's the genius of where we are here in comp in encapsulating all these things the consciousness this, which puts spirit into flesh the soul the emotions of the body the mental thoughts of the body um, it's it's a beautiful harmony if you give everything its space if you like an orchestra if you just let the violins play or just let the timpanis bang and in much of an orchestra you have to give the whole or the whole concert hall and let all things play, and then, then, then you're, the, you're able to, to modify the harmony, see where the song is going, listen to the whole of you. Like um, a conductor. Like a conductor. I, I hesitated to use that analogy, because that's, that's mental for people. Oh, the conductor is conducting everything. No, you know? it, I'm with you. I'm with you. No, I understand where you're coming from. It has to do with being able to set pace yep. and the tone and the intensity and the concentration and the conductor would be able to um, express the emotion that's being felt or the rhythm or the bring the drama to fullness and then back down into silence mm, I like that so that is understanding that you your consciousness chooses how the song is going to be done. And, uh, and exactly what Tolly says, you, know, you, you get to choose um, what happens next. You know, it's your, 
you know, you all these things want to pull you off. The emotion wants to turn you into a raging beast. The mind, the mind wants to turn you into an anxiety-ridden or a past living or something like that type of of mental ma- to machine. Keep you in a, to keep you in a mental state. Right, and the consciousness is no. We're just going to be, and I'm angry, and lots of little stories are everywhere. And okay, let's go to the next moment. Oh, a different moment. <laughs> you know, that's totally with with his. Endlessly, he, yes. He lets it pass. It's not just because it's, it sounds somewhat dismissive when you say, oh, well, you know. No, no, I mean, not, I, I mean, the ah the, the, uh, the was, was enjoying that moment. And, ah, oh, the next moment, you know, his, his kind of, you know, his, he sighs into these things. Ah, oh, the next moment. Ah, uh, fullness and fullness, the space. Yes. The yes. fullness and the space. And then when it's done, that's when the next moment takes. It's not reaching forward to the next nope. moment. It is you are in this state and allowing it all to express until it's done. Yeah. And, and, and that I, requires patience. Also, uh, very important. So, you know, to come back to our, our original theme, um, so emotional thinking is is... It's both a contradiction in terms, it's an oxymoron, but it, it is a, a sort of a, a way of, of tearing yourself in par, into parts. Um, rather than give emotions space, we trammel them with thoughts and actions and turn them into monsters by feeding them and giving them, you know, keeping them going far beyond the point where they would have, have normally dissipated because Emotions are ephemeral and, and designed to be so. Thoughts can go through a lifetime, but emotions are supposed to come and go like tides. Uh, if, we, if we hold back the tide, we're, we're, we're doing it a disservice. If we try to channel it or tear it into pieces, we're, we're, we're ruining its purpose. You need to allow your emotions the space. You said you need to acknowledge them. You need to understand that they're precious and ephemeral. You're going to feel bad for a while, and then you're going to feel fine. Because feelings come and go. Just as thoughts. And, and, but don't use thoughts against feelings. Don't use feelings against thoughts. Live in both of them, you know. Live well, in both. The exercise in the meditation is to watch them rise hmm. and then fall. Just as the tide rolls in and rolls out. Yep. And um, in... In the discipline of that, you know, the Dalai Lama's discipline of realizing that, yes, you've already become emotional, yes, your thoughts have already started to make a story, and in the third stage, stop and say, oh, what am I doing? Okay, just let it be. So that third stage of stopping the action, stopping the consequences, is, is where the discipline can, be, can begin. It's the, it's, it's the only place that's accessible to you unless you go further. Initially, you you won't understand the emotion; it'll already be there. And, and and secondly, you won't understand that you've built the stories; they're gonna be going. But you've just got to stop yourself right there and say, "Okay," and just be for whatever period of time there is. And I am Michael Lyons. Ah. <laughs> and I was going to say, you need to breathe in that oh. moment. <sighs> Go ahead. Seriously, you need to just breathe in that moment. No thought, no emotion. Breathe. And I'm Margaret. And she's breathing. And thank you for listening. 